morning, everyone. My name is Alex Riley. I'm state rep from the 134th district. And that is the district on the map here. So just so everyone has their bearings, this line here is Campbell Street. And then it goes down south to the uh, Christian County line, which is right here. And then uh, goes up and takes Seminole over to National and then National up north to a little north of the Phelps Grove Park. And then this is a street called Catalpa right here. And then it kind of follows generally the Springfield city limits over there on the west side. So that's kind of the, the general geographic makeup of the district. Kind of interesting, it's one of the smallest districts in geographic area in the state. So there are some districts that cover six, seven counties, and then mine is, you know, three, four miles long. So it's, it's kind of interesting, uh, but it's, it's very compact. There's a lot of population in that area. Each district has about 37, 38,000 people in it. So um, yeah, so like Mr. Crocker said, I was just elected this past November. So just finished up my first session uh, a couple weeks ago or a couple months ago now. Um, and as you probably know, so our, our session in, in Missouri lasts from uh, beginning of January through the middle of May. And I'm apparently out of breath from running up the stairs still, so let me catch my breath. Okay. So um, just a little bit about me. Um, state rep isn't a full-time gig. It's, it's, well, it's not officially a full-time gig. So um, in addition to my state rep duties, I, uh, I, I'm an attorney here in town. I represent businesses when they get sued and they run into legal issues and they need some legal help. So that's, that's really the job that pays the bills and uh, keeps the lights on at my house. But um, that's, that's what I do for uh, a living outside my state rep duties. <coughs> and I'm still out of breath. <laughs> okay, so um, I've been involved in uh, politics since I was about 12 years old. Um, I, I came of age sort of right after September 11th happened. So um, that's kind of the, the, the main event that really shaped my worldview growing up. And um, I, uh, I got involved on a U.S. Senate race when I was 12, just knocking doors for a Senate candidate. And it was kind of odd because my parents weren't political at all. That wasn't something that, you know, they just raised us to be little political activists. That didn't happen at all. Um, they voted and that was about it. But there was something about the things that were going on in the country, the world at that time that really caught my attention as a 12 year old and made me want to really help in, in the way that I knew how, which was to get involved uh, politically here in town. So since that point, I was, uh, I, I worked on a, a political campaign, at least one, pretty much uh, every election cycle after that from the time I was 12 up until uh, I ran my own race uh, this past cycle. So um, the things that really led me to run now, I, I wasn't necessarily planning on running myself at this point in life. Um, not necessarily the, the most convenient time for me personally. Uh, I've got two young kids. I've got a two and a half year old and a 10 month old. So it's a little challenging to um, do the job where you have to go up to Jeff City for three, four days a week and not be home with the kids as much as you would like to. So it wasn't necessarily um, a convenient time in life, but there were some things going around the country that I was really concerned about that really caught my attention. And then um, more specifically, some, some concerns I had with, with things happening here in Springfield. So um, I was born and raised in Springfield. I've lived here my whole life. I've actually lived within like three miles of where I currently live for 20 plus years of my life. So um, it's kind of cool. I get to represent my parents. I'm their state rep, so that's kind of a fun thing for me personally. But um, one of those things that really caused me a lot of concern was sort of economic conditions here in Springfield. So as those of you who are from Springfield know, we've had really high poverty rates for a long time, in excess of 25%. And that was even before the COVID shutdowns and things like that, where those problems uh, even grew. So I, I always wanted to do something that would really, um, really address some of those economic concerns. I think it's really hard for people to be able to live their most meaningful lives if they're always struggling to figure out how they're going to just pay their basic bills, you know, have shelter, have a place to live, 
have food on the table, things like that. So um, that, that was something that has always caused me a great deal of concern. And um, one of the reasons that I really decided to run. So as I've been in the house, my main focus has been on economic issues. Uh, those, are, those tend to be the types of bills that I file. Um, and then I kind of have a two-tier approach to how I uh, work on some of the economic things in the house. So uh, I, I get to sit on the, budget, the house budget committee that's responsible for um, addressing the budget, writing the state budget, making sure it's balanced, and um, organizing our state's priorities. So there I focus on, on micro issues, so Springfield in particular especially. And um, I tend to be someone who's a little skeptical that government programs um, really provide the, the, the long-term assistance uh, that people need, I think, that there are, um, that, that the data doesn't really show that that works long-term. So what I've started to do, really, is work with a lot of our Springfield nonprofits that work in that space with the people who are suffering in these tough conditions and provide state funding to them because a lot of them have really good track records with getting people out of poverty and on the track to long-term success, whereas when you're just looking at a lot of government agencies, um, their track record isn't so good. So for me, as someone sitting on the budget committee, it makes a lot more sense to put our taxpayer dollars into those organizations that have proven track records of success versus these that, while well-intentioned, well -intentioned, don't necessarily do as well. What is so, your what is your day to day operate when you're uh, you, obviously if you're only in a part of the year but when you're in it what's your day to day? So uh, when we're up in Jeff City, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So um, a lot of our time is spent in committee hearings. Um, so that's really where, where a lot of the, the the dirty work, I guess, for lack of a, where the sausage really gets made, where bills get really vetted. So each rep gets assigned to a certain number of committees, um, and and. More or less, those kind of align with your areas of expertise or where you have some experience in. So uh, we get to hear representatives go through those committees. They present their bills to us in committees. We have the opportunity to ask questions, kind of really vet the bills, make sure it's a good idea, make sure there aren't unintended consequences. And then there's an opportunity for the public and interested parties to come in and testify either in favor or against the bill. So that's where we spend really a lot of our time um, while we're in session is, is in those various committees. And then uh, we also um, spend a lot of time on the floor, especially late in session. So on the floor is kind of what most people think of when they think the House of Representatives. That's the big fancy room um, in the Capitol where all 163 of us sit and spend a lot of time debating and pontificating on various things. So that's kind of what the day-to-day -day looks like. Um, and then a lot of times in the evenings after you get done with session, um, a lot of people go out and, and eat lunch or, or dinner or whatever and debate bills and things like that. So there's a lot of um, policy work that gets done in the evenings as well. Um, you are obviously a Republican. You kind of already dropped a few breadcrumbs on this, but can you give us your thesis statement? Why that political party and not any other political party? I mean. Simply at its courts, I believe in limited government, and I think that the government should be as uninvolved in individuals' lives as, as possible. There are certain functions that I think, there are certain things that I think government has a responsibility to do, but by and large, I think that I don't know how to run your life as well as you do, and for that reason, I think that the government should be as uninvolved in your life as possible. I mean, it's, it's that simple. All right, so I would like to start off with your permission with a bunch of questions we've submitted that I'll be paraphrasing to you. And um, after a few, I'll open the floor for any other students that want to weigh in. But uh, first of all, let's start off with some COVID questions. It's just, you've visited our class before via Zoom. It's so much nicer having you in person. Yes. And let's just talk about that. Let's talk about the pandemic some. Obviously, the one of the most controversial things of the Biden administration was the announcement he made two or three weeks ago to uh, issue some sort of vaccine mandate for really all <laughs> government employees and businesses that employ, what is it, 100 or more 100 people? Or more, right. What is your general take on that? 
If you don't like it, what should he be doing instead, if anything? So my take on it is I don't like it. Um, but I also tend, so kind of two tiers there. I don't like it, um, but I also tend to be someone, um, and I kind of has a, have a disagreement with a lot of the folks on my side of the aisle that think that if private businesses want to mandate vaccines, that they should be able to do that. Again, it goes back to that limited government. I don't know how to run a hospital better than the people who are running the hospitals. And if they think that that's the way to keep their patients safe, then I think that they as a private entity have the ability to make that decision. And we as government should not come in and say, well, we know better than you and you shouldn't do that. So um, that's kind of where I stand as far as like private entities mandating the vaccines. I think, well, I don't really like that idea. I'm vaccinated. I posted a COVID vaccine clinic, so I don't have a problem with the vaccine itself. It's more the government involvement mandating um, decisions that I really don't like. You know, so, but as far as the, uh, the federal mandate, I'm, I'm completely opposed to that too, because that's where you have a situation where government is coming in and telling private businesses or private entities that, that they have to require their employees to undergo medical treatment. And that's, a, that's concerning to me as well. I just realized, I don't even know if the House of Representatives in Missouri has a vaccine requirement, a vaccine mandate now, do they? We don't. Okay. Uh, would you support such? Would I support mm -hmm. a, a, a mandate requiring for House the, members yeah, to for the, the for the capital, yeah. No, I wouldn't. I, th I think that every individual should be able to make that decision based on their own unique medical needs. So the last time you and I uh, met for uh, a Zoom to talk to a class, we talked about a, a couple things I'd like to follow up on. One of those is Medicaid expansion. Yeah. Um, we Last time we met, we were right in the heat of it, right in the middle of it. And now it's kind of come to a conclusion that the Missouri Supreme Court has weighed in. What are your thoughts on the Missouri Supreme Court's ruling? Do you, uh, just any feedback you'd like to, uh, kind of now that we're at the end of that story? Yeah, so um, there's, there's a lot there, but as you all know, so we in the, in the legislature declined to fund Medicaid expansion. The, uh, and there were a number of reasons for that decision. For me personally, one of my biggest concerns was I had some, some legal concerns. So um, I'll go real briefly because I know we don't have a ton of time, but basically what, what my concerns were and caused me to say, no, we're not funding it right now, was there's a specific portion of the Missouri Constitution, it's Article 3, Section 51, that says that you can't basically, and this is completely paraphrased, but this is the idea, you can't create new programs by ballot initiative unless you provide a funding mechanism within that same ballot initiative. So we have this, but that's exactly what happened with the Medicaid vote, or at least that was one of my concerns. You had this new program that got created at the ballot saying that you had to fund this new program. Um, so you have that at the same time, so you have that Article 3, Section 51, at the same time as you have this other portion of the Missouri Constitution, which seems to require us to fund this new Medicaid program. So to me as an attorney, you have what appeared to me to be two conflicting items in the same document, yet the Constitution more or less in conflict with itself. And I thought that that needed some court um, some court resolution to try and either reconcile it or tell us, you know, what's what's what do we have to what's what do we need to do with this situation? So what the court Supreme Court ultimately did is they they found a way where they were able to say that that Medicaid provision did not violate that Article Three, Section Fifty One. It wasn't unconstitutional, and they kind of created a way that um, those two provisions didn't conflict with each other. So um, where we are now is Medicaid expansion is currently happening, but there is still some debate over what ultimately will happen with that, because the, the Missouri Supreme Court also seemed to give the legislature some discretion as to whether, uh, they didn't say we had to fund it. I suspect it will ultimately get funded um, just because it's currently happening right now and the legislature isn't in session. So there's not really anything we could do about it even if we wanted to. Um, so, that, but that's basically where things stand now. 
is Medicaid expansion is happening. The Supreme Court said it wasn't unconstitutional. So they kind of addressed my constitutional concerns. And um, it, it's currently happening now. A tragic story out of Texas the last few days uh, with the, was it a high school shooting? Is I think that's school right. school shooting. You know, oddly enough, we had Crystal Quaid in about a week ago, and she fielded a question from a student about arming instructors. Uh, between her presentation and your presentation was the Texas school shooting. What, how do, you're not emperor of Missouri, you're a representative, but how, if you could wave a magic wand, what do we need to be doing to make our schools safer? You know, that's a tough question. And I think if we had an answer to that, that would be the, the golden ticket that would resolve this, that would be in place already. So I don't know that there is an answer that's just going to completely resolve that situation. I do think that perhaps in some areas it does make sense to train teachers to carry weapons. The, the, the issue now when you can see it as a problem or you can see it as a good thing is there are more guns floating around in the United States than there are people. There are probably 330 million guns at least um, that are floating around and there's that many people too. Which means, I mean, even if you were to, to ban all weapons at this point, there's still hundreds of millions of guns out there that are going to end up in somebody's hands. And I, I just have a, I think that if you start banning them, if you start using some, some gun control measures, um, the problem is it just, it, it places the, the weapons in the hands of people who already don't obey the law and takes the weapons out of the hands of the people like me and probably some of you in here who, who do obey the law. So I think that maybe in a perfect world, if you could just ban all weapons, maybe you could do that. But that's not where we are in this country. So we're, we're always going to be in a situation where there's going to be a lot of guns on the street. And the question is just how do you best make sure that um, the, the people who are trying to obey the law are best able to protect themselves? Well, let's stay with Texas for a bit, because Texas obviously was in the news the past month or so. Texas had a past day. Um, uh, a, uh, an abortion law. Um, we asked Quaid about that as well. Uh, would you like to weigh in? What are your thoughts on that, abor that, that Texas abortion law? Would you like to see it in place in Missouri? Why, why not? So I'll be 100% honest. I have not done a deep legal dive into that law. Um, I know it, it creates kind of an odd mechanism for enforcement that we haven't really seen in other laws. Um, I'll just be 100% honest. I haven't studied it enough to be able to say one way or another whether I think that would be an appropriate course for our state to go. Okay. <clears throat> um, now, on top of that, we, uh, we, we, there was an interesting point raised recently about initiatives because Missouri is, as you probably agree, Missouri is not a uniform state. Missouri is kind of bizarre in a way. They tend to be very Republican in how they elect, but when it comes to initiatives, they tend to be very mixed, sometimes more conservative, sometimes more progressive with how they feel on initiatives. Um, there has been reporting that the Missouri House of uh, the Missouri General Assembly might be taking up initiatives in the upcoming session or two. What are your thoughts on initiatives and are there any reforms that need to happen? So I think the answer to that is there certainly are reforms that need to happen. And even that, that there's bipartisan agreement that there's reforms that need to happen. What exactly those reforms look like is where you start to have some disagreement. So right now, and we're one of the only states that allows constitutions to be changed like this is if 50% plus one of the voters on a particular election day decide to amend the state constitution, they can do that at the ballot box. And that's, that's very unusual when you look at the other states in the country. That's resulted in Missouri having a, a constitution that's much larger than almost every other state in the country. We have some odd things in the constitution that aren't necessarily bad but it's just weird that they're in the Constitution. We have things like bingo in our state Constitution. We have things like medical marijuana in the state Constitution. Again, not necessarily terrible things, but just really odd that that's now in the Constitution. You know, Medicaid expansion is now in the state Constitution. That's kind of an odd thing to be in the Constitution. So um, there's been a number of efforts to raise that threshold to uh, change the state Constitution at the ballot box. You know, some people say, well, it would make more sense for it to be, you know, 60% of the voters to 
say yes on something before you can change the constitution of the state. Some people say, well, two thirds makes more sense because that's more comparable to uh, a lot of other ways to change the constitution. So I, I'm certainly um, in favor of strengthening those requirements. I think it is a little too easy right now to change our state constitution, but um, there's a lot of debate over how best to do that. Can we stay on the subject of the state constitution? Because uh, unless I am mistaken, and I might be, I, uh, hopefully you and I get a chance to do this again in 2022. But in 2022, I believe there, uh, every 20 years, we, we as Missourians get to vote as to whether we want to keep the Missouri constitution or whether we want to assemble a constitutional convention and rewrite it. Uh, I believe that vote's coming up in 2022. Do you have any feedback on that at yeah, this point? Yeah, you're right about that. And it's the weirdest thing because no one is talking about it. Yeah. No one's talking about it in Jeff City either. Like most of the reps don't know that that's actually a thing yeah. that's coming up. So I haven't heard anything about it. The last time the state actually changed the constitution was I think 1948. And then we've just been amending it and putting a lot of these crazy things I just told you about in there now. Um, but yeah, that is coming up. What exactly that looks like, I don't know. No one's talking about it. Well, what does constitutional convention look like? I don't know what it looks I don't know either. Um, one last thing I'd like to talk about before I open the floor. If, if you don't, if you don't forgive me, well, let's go federal for a moment, uh, because right now there are two massive laws being discussed or bills, I guess you should say, in Congress. One of which is that $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill, and then there's that gigantic reconciliation, Build Back Better. You know, obviously, both of these things will funnel billions of dollars to Missourians should they pass. What is your general feedback on either or both laws? So, flat out, I oppose both of them, and I don't. I did. I don't just oppose those. I oppose the ones that were going through when the Republicans controlled office as well. I, one of my biggest beefs with Republicans in federal office is they run on, you know, balanced budget and fiscal responsibility and things like that, and then they get to Washington D.C. and they spend trillions and trillions, and they're no better than anybody else. So I think one of the biggest policy failures during the Trump years was. He spent way too much money, and that's continuing now and at a much more rapid pace. So I just have a lot of concerns over, I mean, we're, we're just trillions and trillions of dollars that we're never going to be able to find the, the dollars to pay for it. There's just no way. So it just adds even more to the national debt, which is already overwhelming. We're never going to be able to get out of that either. So I, I really don't think that it's a, a financially responsible thing to continue with this debt-fueled spending. Uh, you are correct, so there will be plenty of um, dollars that come down to the state from those packages. But we've received um, billions in the prior uh, COVID response rescue packages as well that we haven't even spent that money yet, frankly. So um, I, I, I'm just really skeptical that that's a good thing to do at this stage in our, uh, our country. Uh, sir, forgive me. I just realized that we are together in a community college. We got to talk about that because one of the things being discussed in that massive bill is the idea of tuition-free community college. Since you're standing in one right now, would you like to weigh in on that? Good idea, bad idea? How would you tweak it? What do you think? You know, I'm not, I'm not inherently opposed to the idea of free community college. It's kind of interesting. You have seen a few um, Republican states do this. I think Tennessee is one that recently enacted free community college in their state. If, you, if, if the budget dollars are there to do it, um, I'm not opposed to it. Because you know, going back to one of the things I was talking about earlier with economics and my focus on economics is we have a real workforce issue here in the state. So uh, we've had some issues in the past with not having good paying jobs in Missouri uh, and in Springfield in particular. We have that now. One of the issues that we're really facing, and then I hear this all the time when I'm going around visiting to our employers, is we've got jobs, we just don't have people that are trained to be able to do these jobs. So I think that's one of the things that community colleges do well, is they train people to get into these jobs and, and, and good paying jobs without incurring a lot of the, you know, the tens of thousands of debt that you might incur at a four-year school, for example. So uh, I'm not inherently opposed to the idea if the, if the money is there. Guys, on any, let's open the floor up right now. On any of the topics we have discussed or other ones, uh, sir, you always have the right of refusal, but if anybody has any questions, feel free to raise your hand, and it's your floor now. You can call on whoever. 
I, I kind of like to keep it out on a national level for now. Um, so I have family that have uh, been missionaries in Haiti, and uh, there are a lot of family friends, the husband and wife in particular, that have been deterred from going to the border. I wanted to get your take on the crisis and Biden's response at the border right now. Well, I'm obviously, What's going on down there is, is just heartbreaking. You see these images, and I haven't been down there personally, so I'm just seeing the same pictures that everyone else is seeing when you've got thousands of people just packed into this tiny place and it's you know miserably hot and things like that. It, it's, it's really horrible. So I'm, I'm someone, uh, and again, this puts me in a little different spot than a lot of the more traditional members in my party. I think that we need to have a, a very open immigration system. I think that we need to have, we need to vet people that are coming in, but it shouldn't take seven or eight years for someone that wants to come to the United States and become a productive member of our society to be stuck in this limbo period for seven or eight years. I think we have a system that's, that's tremendously broken. So broadly speaking, I support loosening up that system or at least opening up ways where it does not take people as long to become to, to become citizens of this country. So I, I'm certainly opposed to just, you know, open borders and things like that where you don't have any control over who's coming in. I think that would be a terrible system. But we do need to have a system where if you have people who want to come here, they want to contribute to our society, they want to take advantage of the blessings that we all have as Americans, that that's something that we should all support um, and, and there's a lot of work on our immigration system to just open that up. Um, and I think that would help with some of the crisis that we see uh, every year, frankly, with people trying to cross the border. Follow-up question to his question. Uh, what, would you, cause, uh, uh, what would you do about uh, immigrants that are here illegally currently? So um, I think it's probably impractical to say that we're going to just round up 10, 20 million illegal immigrants and, throw them out of the country. I, so I kind of have a two-tiered two approach to that. If there are people who've been here for a long time, they're contributing to, the society, to our society, they have jobs, they have families, they do things like that, that we do need to have some type of pathway for them to become citizens and stay here. For people who have criminal records, they're just here committing crimes, things like that, I really don't have um, a great deal of respect for people who are here doing that, and I would support um, exporting those individuals. Any other questions for Representative Riley as he's with us? As we continue to wait, sir, allow me to ask you. Go ahead. There's one in the back there. Uh, how would you feel about uh, government involvement in funding uh, slowing down climate change? government involvement slowing down climate change. So what, what type of, specifically? Are you talking about research into climate change and things like that? I think part of it is an effort to stop climate change. I'm not sure how much money they're putting into that or like what field it goes into, but a big chunk of money is gonna, if that bill gets passed, but a big chunk of money is gonna put, be put towards so some of it is investment in uh, electric vehicles. Some of it is for electric charging stations. Obviously, there's a portion that might be more controversial that would punish or tax businesses that exceed certain emissions levels. How do you feel on any of the things I just mentioned? And what might you yourself do about climate change yourself? Yeah, so in, in respect to climate change, I think the thermometer speaks for itself. So if, if the data shows that the Earth is warming or cooling, then I think the thermometer speaks for itself. I think the issue that becomes more challenging is how do you address that climate change and can you actually do anything that helps and makes a meaningful difference and then what's the, what's the resulting cost of that? Um, so I, I'm a person, I'm very much in favor of um, alternative energy sources. So I think that's, that's something that we can actually do at the state level. So one of the, one of the bills we worked on in the House last year was a bill that would um, open up nuclear energy possibilities here in the state. As you all probably know, nuclear energy is one of the cleanest sources of energy out there, certainly much cleaner than coal and things like that, your traditional fossil fuels. 
So um, to the extent that things like that could potentially help with climate change, um, I'm, I'm very much in support of those type of efforts. Again, I do get skeptical of um, a great deal of government funding, especially when we don't have money right now. I mean, we just don't. Um, and you know, I know people talk about taxing various, you know, increasing corporate taxes or increasing taxes on billionaires and millionaires and things like that. And I, I understand that, but at the same time, I don't think there are enough millionaires and billionaires in the country to tax that you'd be able to get enough money to pay for all these types of endeavors. So um, I, I guess to answer your question, I'm pretty skeptical of spending a lot of government resources now on that, but I am in favor of opening up avenues for the private sector to get involved because there you do see a lot of private sector companies now that are becoming aware of this. They think it's a problem. They think it's something worth solving. So I'm in favor of doing things that allow them to uh, go out and try and solve the problems. Other questions? Um, if I can recall correctly, I believe the state of Missouri only currently has one nuclear power plant. It was built a long time ago. I know you, you just got into your position last November. Why do you think that is? Is it a funding thing? Or? So I think there are a number of reasons for it. Um, I think you're right. The, the plant that I'm aware of is kind of actually out towards Jeff City. Yeah. It's in a place called Callaway, which is a little east of Jeff City. Um, I think there are a number of reasons for it. Uh, so after you had some of those very high profile nuclear disasters in the 80s, uh, government came in and put a lot of regulations and burdens in place that really make it almost impossible to open up new nuclear facilities in the state. Um, so I think that was kind of not unusual, but a knee-jerk reaction to a, a problem that happened. And it's now, you know, we're 40 plus years past a lot of that. That technology has really improved even more since then. So now I think there would be a market for it if we can get some of those regulatory hur uh, hurdles out of the way. Can I ask real quick about a pet project that I've been tracking uh, back when uh, the, the guy that held your seat before was the Speaker of the House right. in Missouri, Elijah Har, uh, an OTC graduate, just FYI. Yep. Anyways, a pet project of his that he worked for for several years was high-speed rail here in, uh, here in Missouri. Uh, obviously, we don't have it. Do we know what the status of that is at this point? Is it kind of just on ice at this point, or is there still some progress? Being made? So what was happening there was we were trying to get a test track into Missouri, and now the name of that is escaping me. Do you remember what it was called? I don't remember. No. I can't remember either. Nope. But what we were trying to what we were trying to do is we were trying to encourage this company to build a test track here in Missouri that ultimately would have been expanded to have a high speed rail between Kansas City and St. Louis. It'd take you like 30 minutes to go all the way across the state was basically the idea of it. So we were doing some things, and this was this predated my term in the legislature. But we were doing some things to try and encourage that company to build their test track here and, and hopefully expand so that it, those two cities would be connected. Um, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your perspective,